Well, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds and uh, a special welcome to Suzanne and all the Fishman family members uh, attending this lecture. Um, before getting to our stellar speaker, I, I'm just gonna say a few words about uh, Dr. Fishman. So it is actually with mixed feelings that I introduced the 2021 Fishman Endowed Lecture as many as of you know, Dr. Fishman passed away last week and this lecture honors his significant contributions to patient care, teaching, research, a mentorship of many fellows in endocrinology over the last uh, four decades. <coughs> Dr. Fishman joined uh, the university in 1967 uh, as chief of endocrinology at the VA after receiving superb training at top institutions in this country, including Harvard, NIH, and fellowship in endocrinology at Vanderbilt. And during his uh, research career here in Miami, he made uh, significant contributions to different areas of uh, adrenal physiology, biology, and published over 120 manuscripts in his career. He was uh, recognized by his colleagues as a super clinician, educator, mentor, and successful scientist with excellent administration skills that really strengthened the research mission, both at the university and the uh, Miami VA. Everybody who knew him will say that above all, he was kind, humble, and a caring individual and human being. And in 2004, the Lawrence uh, Fishman Visiting Professorship in Endocrinology was established by the generosity of some of his former fellows to commemorate his stellar service to the uh, school and to the uh, VA. I also like to thank his wife, Suzanne, and uh, the Fishman family members for their commitment to maintain the visit visiting professorship continue existence. And in closing, during the last five years, I enjoyed my interaction with Dr. Fishman. During planning of this lecture, I really developed a deep appreciation for his uh, cheerful personality, optimism, and unlimited support to the division. Today, we are fortunate to have Dr. Sam Klein as the 2021 Fishman visiting professor, and he will be introduced back, Dr. Rafa. Thank you, Sam, for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Samuel Klein. Dr. Klein joins us from Washington University in St. Louis, where he is the Danforth Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Geriatrics and Nutritional Sciences, as well as the Director of the Center for Human Nutrition Center for Applied Research Sciences, and the Weight Management Program. He received his medical degree from Temple University and his master's in nutrition, nutritional biochemistry and metabolism from MIT. He completed residency in internal medicine and a clinical nutrition fellowship at Boston University, an NIH nutrition and metabolism research fellowship at Harvard, and a gastroenterology fellowship at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Dr. Klein has published more than 400 papers on nutrition, metabolism, and obesity, and has received numerous awards for his research and mentorship. His research focuses on understanding the mechanisms responsible for metabolic dysfunction associated with obesity, the pathophysiology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and the therapeutic effects of weight loss. He is past president of the North American Association for the Study of Obesity and the American Society for Clinical Nutrition, and inaugural chair of the Integrative Physiology of Obesity and Diabetes NIH study section. Today, he will be presenting on a topic titled Physiological and Clinical Implications of Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease. Without further ado, I will hand over the stage to Dr. Klein. Gabriella, thank you for the very nice and kind introduction. <clears throat> Please nod if you can hear me to make sure. Okay, good, we'll go forward. So first of all, thank you very much. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, my condolences to the um, Fishman family and friends as well for his recent death, uh, really um, 
very saddened, but hopefully that this lectureship and Adama's lectureship will keep his memory alive and be a comfort uh, to his family and friends as well uh, in the future. I also want to thank Ernesto for this invitation. We're sorry to have lost him from WashU to Miami, but it looks like everything is going south. Even, even Roy Weiss went south uh, as well, but in a good way going south, not, not in, the, in the bad way going south. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank you for even You're on mute, Dr. Klein. You did it again. You're still on mute. You John, can't hear me. You're mute, son. Yeah, how can, it keeps muting me without me touching. Is it good now? Now we can hear you, yes. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, this lectureship in honor of Dr. Fishman uh, is, a, as a honor, is a honor to his um, memory and hopefully will provide comfort to those uh, who knew him as well as his family as well for years and years going forward. Ernesto, thank you for the invitation, uh, for being here. It's really a pleasure. I'm sorry it's not in person, especially uh, during February. Uh, as well. And I'm sorry also with the Zoom calls, people are really getting kind of exhausted uh, with Zoom. So I, I appreciate your patience in sticking with us for another hour uh, during this presentation. <clears throat> um, and uh, what I'd like to do then uh, dur and, and during this presentation is really review uh, issues regarding fatty liver disease because fatty non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a major complication associated with type 2 diabetes and metabolic dysfunction. And so everybody in endocrinology and who sees patients who are obese and type 2 diabetes are going to have patients with, with NAFLD. And it's important to understand, I think, some of the clinical implications of this, as well as some of the physiological background as to what's causing NAFLD. And then you can really decide how important is this really to address this issue in your uh, clinical practices as well. So the first thing, this is the disclosures is shown here. <clears throat> the first thing is really um, to Sam, know that when people become screen. obese from being lean, uh, Sam, nearly every uh, organ Sam, system is Sam, in the body is adversely affected. Um, but the most common complication associated with obesity are the metabolic complications shown here in this middle column uh, of this slide. Dr. And Klein? these metabolic complications include uh, insulin resistance, uh, which is a major underlying feature of all of these complications, as well as some of the complications shown here in orange on the right. Sam, 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 your, your, your screen isn't sharing. Can you oh. sh hear? Sh <clears throat> Com complete loser here. You're not. <laughs> Let's see. Do you really need to see the slides? You tell us. <laughs> now, let's see if I can get this fixed up. Now you're cooking. Put it in presentation mode and we're, okay. we're ready to go. I don't know what happened. Okay. Is that Perfect. good? Perfect. Now you're cooking. Okay. Roy, continue to stay in touch with me during this, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Did anybody see this screen before? First time, good, okay. And you can hear me, right? Oi, guts of Duncan, all right. <laughs> so the most common complications when people become obese, uh, are in, in, which affects every organ system then, are the metabolic ones are shown here as I just mentioned. And of these complications, atherogenic dyslipidemia, beta cell failure resistance, which causes type two diabetes, it includes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which are all risk factors for heart disease and stroke. So fatty liver disease is part of this constellation of metabolic dysfunction that's associated with becoming obese. And in addition to that, we now know that other abnormalities such as uh, cancer, cognitive dysfunction, or dementia, osteoarthritis, hypertension, may all have insulin resistant underlying pathologies as well. And so this metabolic dysfunction or metabolic syndrome 
may include much more than the diseases that we think about uh, today. Now, not all people who become obese develop these complications. And a percentage of people who become obese don't get fatty liver, they don't have diabetes, they don't have abnormal lipids, and they're metabolically normal, metabolically healthy. We don't really understand the mechanisms of why some people uh, develop these complications or most people develop complications. And a small subset of people seem to be resistant from the adverse effects of excess adiposity. And I'm gonna try to address that during this presentation. Now, the definition of what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is really quite vague. <clears throat> and it's based on a study such as this one. This is a Dallas Heart Study where the definition of non-alcoholic fatty liver is based on measuring liver fat content by using magnetic resonance imaging. And if you take people who are completely healthy uh, with no abnormalities in their uh, liver biochemistries and no risk factors for metabolic abnormalities, you find that the mean plus two standard deviations or the 95th percentile of their intrahepatic triglyceride content measured by magnetic resonance imaging is 5.6%. So this cutoff here has been used to diagnose fatty liver from non-fatty liver based on that normal population in the Dallas Heart Study plus two standard deviations. Now, if you use that definition, then 34% of the adults that were studied in Dallas had steatosis. They had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And how do you define the non-alcoholic part? It's also quite vague. For women, it's 14 or fewer drinks of alcohol a week. And for men, it's 21 or fewer drinks per week. So if you're a woman and you eat, drink 15 units of alcohol every week, you have alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if you drink 14 drinks a week, you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And getting a reliable history of alcohol intake is really very, very um, difficult, as well as I'm sure there's heterogeneity and the effect of alcohol on the liver as well. But this is what we use now as a definition not drinking too much and having increased fat uh, in your liver. Now the prevalence of NAFLD among people who are obese is very high and among people of type two diabetes is very high. So about 70% of obese people have increased intrahepatic triglyceride content measured by magnetic resonance imaging. And the same holds true for type two diabetes. So anybody who's seeing patients with diabetes or seeing patients who are obese are gonna see patients with fatty liver. So it's important for all clinicians to understand the implications of that uh, in their clinical practice. The, the natural history of NAFL has been based on these longitudinal uh, retrospective analyses of longitudinal studies where people have gotten repeated uh, liver biopsies for different reasons over time. And this is the general consensus of opinion, although this is now soft data showing what the natural history is. It looks like about 30% of, of people will develop steatosis who are adults. They will have increased intrahepatic fat content, intrahepatic triglyceride content. And about 15% of these people will go back to normal liver as well. And so this is not static. This is a dynamic process where once you have steatosis in a subsequent liver biopsy, you may no longer have steatosis. And here's a histological you know, assessment of a steatotic liver. You can see these white uh, uh, areas are all uh, fat lipid droplets inside of hepatocytes where the lipid has been washed out uh, during this staining period. People with steatosis can progress to developing NASH, but only 15% progress. Most people who have fatty liver disease stay at steatosis. A very small percentage progress onto NASH, which means there's inflammation and some fibrosis. And you can see the trichrome staining here of, of collagen that's showing this fibrotic characteristics uh, in this population. And also this is not stable. 6% of people in NASH will have normal liver if you biopsy or get them again in the, in the future. Now this might be really regression or it could just be the heterogeneity of these biopsies. But what's interesting is that as you progress with more severe inflammatory and fibrotic liver disease, the fat starts to go away. And you can even see here that the fat globules in white is less than it is here in the previous slide. And then about 20% of these people who have NASH will go on to develop cirrhosis. And that, of course, is very severe. You can see the, the regenerating nodules in this histological section. You see absolutely no liver fat uh, once you develop cirrhosis. And cirrhosis is a fatal, you know, very bad outcome, both clinically in terms of complications, uh, as well as death and an increased risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, this takes quite a long time, as I'll review in the next few slides. 
you don't just go from steatosis to cirrhosis right away. It takes many, many years and people die from other things usually before they ever develop uh, cirrhosis. This, this figure here shows the mortality rate of all causes in people with normal liver and progressively increasing stages of fibrosis from one to four. Now stage four fibrosis or F4 is cirrhosis. And so anything less is less than cirrhosis as shown here. And this shows the all cause mortality. And this is the mortality from liver disease. So they die from um, hepatocellular carcinoma or from hepatic failure as shown here. Now, once you develop fibrosis, you begin to increase your risk of all cause mortality. And it's quite high as you can see here, especially when you get into the cirrhosis stage, but this far exceeds the cause of death in the liver. So if you have stage two fibrosis, your liver related mortality is shown here, which is about 15% of your all cause mortality, which is primarily of course from uh, cardiovascular disease. If you have stage three fibrosis, about 20% of the deaths are from liver disease. But when you get to cirrhosis, then about 50, 55% of deaths are related to liver disease of all cause mortality. So the importance of NAFLD in terms of causing, causing liver related mortality progressively increases with increasing fibrosis. So if you can prevent cirrhosis, that's huge. Uh, if you can prevent, if you just get rid of fi, uh, stage two fibrosis, you're not gonna have a major impact uh, on mortality. And we know also now that uh, NAFLD is the second leading cause of liver transplantation in this country and soon will be the leading cause of liver transplantation because hepatitis C is so effectively treated. Now it takes a long time to go from stage one to stage four. If you have just fatty liver, you increase each stage of fibrosis every 14 years. So it takes you a long time to get to a more serious form of fibrosis and you'll very likely die from heart disease before you get there. If you already have NASH, and have more infl inflammation of fibrosis, you increase these stages every seven years. So you can go from one to four um, in about 21 years, so it takes quite a long time. But about 20% of people with NASH are considered rapidly progressors, where they can go from zero to four uh, in four years. Now, this is a major problem. Unfortunately, we don't, can't identify who these people are in advance because that's the target population you really want to address because the population is so, because NAFL is so common in a population, treating everybody with NAFL would be very, very expensive if you had good treatments. Uh, but treating these rapid progressors would be really an important, uh, important target. But diagnosing that is just not possible at the present time. Now, as I mentioned, NAFL is tightly coordinate or interactive with metabolic dysfunction. And so you can see in this very nice study from the Mayo Clinic uh, shown here where they followed people with fatty liver disease for five to seven years, you can see the percent incidence of heart disease mortality, about 25%. Uh, this is cut off in my slide. I, uh, I think this is maybe blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and I'm not sure what this one is as well because I can't see it in the bottom of my slide but you can see all the metabolic complications of, uh, that are associated with obesity and diabetes uh, are increased in people that have fatty liver disease and develop the incidence is very high uh, over time. 90% of patients with NAFLD have at least one metabolic syndrome criteria and a third have metabolic syndrome itself. So this relationship of NAFLD and metabolic dysfunction diabetes is very tightly uh, interwoven. So that's really the clinical kind of background of NAFLD. Now I wanna review some of the pathophysiology that's associated with NAFLD to understand its metabolic implications. Having fat in the liver is an important marker of metabolic health and metabolic dysfunction, except in certain groups that have a decrease uh, uh, fat in the liver, such as uh, African-Americans, they have low liver fat content in relationship to their insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction but everybody, most other people uh, do not. And so having increased fat in your liver is a more important marker of metabolic health than visceral fat. And so if you take people like we did here and match them on liver fat content, match them on BMI and percent total body fat, but separate them on liver fat content, 3.7% of total liver volume is fat versus 25% total liver volume of fat, you can see that those that have high intrahepatic triglyceride content 
have impaired insulin sensitivity in the liver and impaired whole body insulin sensitivity measured during a clamp procedure where you measure the ability of insulin to stimulate glucose rate of disappearance or glucose uptake. And so fat in the liver is a major marker of metabolic dysfunction and it is much more important than visceral fat and probably and possibly the relationship between visceral fat and metabolic dysfunction might be due to its relationship of visceral fat with intrahepatic triglyceride content because those two often track together. Now the amount of fat in your liver seems to correlate with how insulin resistant you are. So if you measure insulin resistance with a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp procedure as we did here in this study where <clears throat> the ability of insulin to stimulate glucose uptake is measured while you're infusing insulin at an increased dose, at a physiologically increased dose, you can see that the greater your intrahepatic triglyceride content is, the worse is your stimulation of glucose uptake in response to insulin infusion. And so the more fat in your liver, and you can see some people, half of their liver is made up of fat. This is triglyceride inside of hepatocytes, inside of uh, fat cells. And the more fat you have in your liver, the worse is your insulin resistance with incredible variability. So some people with the same amount of liver fat have a huge variability in insulin sensitivity. So it's considerable heterogeneity, but there's this general correlation as shown here. This is true not only of whole body insulin sensitivity, but also in liver insulin sensitivity, as well as adipose tissue insulin sensitivity. <clears throat> and so one important question is, why would having increased fat in your liver be responsible for insulin resistance in other organs elsewhere? Is there a signal from the liver that's causing insulin resistance or is liver fat simply a marker of metabolic dysfunction? And that's not quite clear cut, but it looks more and more that increased fat in your liver is a marker of metabolic health and not a cause of abnormal metabolic health. <coughs> and in fact, if you were to take people who have different degrees of adiposity, as we've done here, uh, Fevin Matos did this very nice little uh, uh, retrospective analysis of people with class one obesity, they have a BMI of 31.6, and take people with class three obesity, a BMI of 41.5, much larger. Uh, these are much heavier people, a lot more body fat as well, more intra-abdominal fat, but they're matched on liver fat content. So they have the same amount of liver fat. So independent of the amount of fat you have, if you have the same liver fat content, your VLDL triglyceride secretion rates, which is your major regulator of triglyceride concentrations measured here with isotope tracers, is no different in the two groups. Your ApoB uh, uh, 100 secretion rates, again, ApoB is a major uh, factor in atherosclerosis, is no different. And insulin sensitivity in the liver, which is suppression of glucose rate of appearance, production in the liver, insulin sensitivity in adipose tissue, fatty acid rate of appearance, palmitate rate of appearance, how it's suppressed with insulin and muscle insulin sensitivity, the stimulation of glucose rate of disappearance or glucose disposal is no different between the two groups, despite marked difference in body mass index and body fat content, if they have the same liver fat content. <clears throat> Again, supporting the notion that liver is a very important predictor or determinant uh, of metabolic health. Now, insulin resistance is key to expressing NAFLD. If you're not insulin resistant, it's unlikely to have fatty liver disease. And so being insulin resistant, and insulin resistant, as I, I talked earlier with uh, Rajesh Garg, is really a wastebasket term. You know, what does it really mean? Insulin does so many different things. We usually refer to insulin resistance as insulin's ability to regulate glucose metabolism. So that's insulin's ability to stimulate glucose uptake by, uh, ad by muscle tissue, and insulin's ability to suppress glucose production by the liver. And so you can see here that even people with PNPLA3 mutations, those people have a, a, a increase in the Hispanic Latinx population, and they have a marked increased risk of having fatty liver disease, as well as developing severe liver disease, such as cirrhosis. But you see here, if you take these mutants, this is the double M, uh, the homozygous mutant shown here, if they're lean, if they have a low body mass index and relatively low insulin resistance, they don't develop steatosis. It's only when they become heavier, you see this progressive increase in steatosis. This is also true of their ALT concentrations is as they get heavier, you see the increased damage to the liver as well. And if they're protected from this if they don't generate insulin resistance at high insulin concentrations. And even cirrhosis, 
progressively increases, it seems, uh, with increasing body mass index. But cirrhosis itself is markedly increased, even in lean people uh, who have PMPLA3, suggesting an independent potential pathway of PMPLA3 and causing cirrhosis besides causing fatty liver itself. <clears throat> now, this is a very busy looking slide, but it's very simple. And I'll, I'll, I'll break it down for you because this is really evaluating the pathogenesis cause and pathophysiology that's associated with NAFL. And you can divide this slide into two halves. Uh, this is the fatty liver half on this side, and this is the inflammatory fibrotic half on that side. Now remember, 85% of people who develop the fat in the liver do not go on to develop a more severe uh, liver disease. So something is happening that converts them from fatty liver into more severe <clears throat> fibrosis and hepatitis and even cirrhosis. Now it's unclear if this is really a second hit or third hit has been proposed in, on a fatty liver, or if there are people up front who will develop fatty liver, but up front that hit that gives them fatty liver causes this progression no matter what happens. There's no second hit necessary, and that's still up for debate. The cause of this second approach of going from fatty liver to here is unclear, but clearly it's related to increased inflammation of liver, endocoxin stress, Hepatic, hepatic stellate cell activation to produce the fibrosis. Uh, all of that are the abnormalities in liver that cause this more severe liver disease as a more benign, just fatty liver disease. And the microbiome could be involved in that as it's involved in everything there is in life. If you're happy or unhappy, it's due to your microbiome. If you're a religious Jew or not, it's the microbiome uh, as well. And, if you, uh, and this microbiome may also affect fatty liver uh, disease also. Now, so what causes the increased fat in the liver? It's very simple energy balance equation. It's how much fat you're making and how much fat you're removing. And so the contribution of fat you're making is fatty acids that's delivered from the systemic circulation, fatty acids from the portal circulation, and fatty acids that are released from circulating lipoproteins that are hydrolyzed and release fatty acids to the liver, and also de novo lipogenesis, making fatty acids from carbohydrate de novo makes fatty acids, and that can be stored in the liver as triglyceride. But these fatty acids can be oxidized as a fuel, or they can be secreted as VLDL triglyceride to get rid of those fatty acids and reduce intrahepatic triglyceride content. And so if people have defects in VLDL secretion, if they have a mutation that prevents uh, VLDL triglyceride secretion, like high beta lipoproteinemia, uh, those people will have fatty liver due to a defect in export not due to a milieu that's causing this increased production of fatty acid and triglyceride in the liver. Now, the, this slide also helps understand the link between increased fat in the liver and metabolic dysfunction. Because if you have increased fatty acid and triglyceride in the liver, you have increased VLDL triglyceride secretion, and that causes hypertriglyceridemia and reduces HDL concentrations. In addition, adipose tissue biology that increases the fatty acid delivery uh, to the liver itself can also have abnormal effects that could cause metabolic dysfunction. So these fatty acids going to liver tissue and muscle tissue can cause insulin resistance in those tissue. Uh, these adipose tissue adipocytes, as well as their macrophages in adipose tissue, can produce adipokines and exosomes that I'll talk in a, a few minutes that could also cause insulin resistance in other organs. So it's possible that adipose tissue is a major factor involved in causing fatty liver disease and metabolic dysfunction, not the fat in the liver itself. It's just a marker, like being jaundice. If you have pancreatic cancer, it's a marker of your cancer, but the jaundice is not causing your uh, demise uh, from the cancer. Roy, any questions so far? Can you hear me okay? Alice is good? Okay. <laughs> so now I wanna go through each of those metabolic pathways in the liver to see if those are un dysregulated in people with fatty liver disease. Well, the first one is whether fatty acid oxidation is decreased in people with NAFLD compared to people without NAFLD. The answer is no, it is not decreased. And this is a study from Iki Dravidin's group where she gave insulin an, uh, at a low dose infusion which suppresses lipolysis and would suppress the production of beta hydroxybutyrate formation which is a, a oxidative product from fatty acids in the liver. And you can see the control group and the NAFL group are superimposable. 
There's no difference in ketone body concentrations at all levels of insulin, uh, whether you have NAFLD or not. Again, suggesting there's no defect in fatty acid oxidation in the liver. A more sophisticated study uh, done here by Sean Burgess using expensive, very expensive isotope tracer techniques and expensive magnetic resonance imaging time with a high resolution magnet shows that beta hydroxybutyrate uh, production or turnover rate is no different in high liver fat people versus low intrahepatic triglyceride people. And actually TCA cycle activity flux, which is again, making energy uh, in the liver cell through mitochondria is increased in people with NAFLD, not decreased. So there's no good evidence that fatty acid oxidation, respiration in livers of people with NAFLD is defective. Now, what about VLDL triglyceride kinetics? Because I mentioned the secretion of VLDL triglyceride shown here can also regulate intrahepatic triglyceride content. Well, if you're obese with NAFLD, as we did here in this very carefully matched group again, same BMI, but differences in liver fat content, you see that VLDL triglyceride secretion measured with isotope tracers is double in the NAFLD group compared to the normal, obese normal group. And so VLDL triglyceride secretion is not defective. If anything, it's increased. And this is a major mechanism for causing hypertriglyceridemia. Now, these yellow and gray bars represent systemic and non-systemic contributions to VLDL triglyceride secretion. Systemic means that what we can measure with our tracer, that's fatty acids coming from plasma that's going into the liver that we can measure with our systemic tracers. So this is fatty acids that are being released from subcutaneous fat that's being used to make a triglyceride, oops, that's being used to make uh, uh, triglycerides in the liver. But there's other con contributors to liver fatty acid and triglyceride that we can't measure with the tracer. And that's fatty acids released by intra-abdominal fat through the portal vein. That's fatty acids released from triglyceride, rich lipoproteins that are hydrolyzed, re uh, releasing fatty acids, and from de novo lipogenesis. So all these three sources represent this gray bar here. Now these can be measured uh, in human beings by using isotope tracer techniques. One, we can measure intrahepatic de novo lipogenesis by looking at the incorporation of palmitate made de novo from carbohydrate in fatty acids in the liver by looking at that co contribution in circulating VLDL triglyceride with the assumption, and this assumption is accurate, that VLDL triglyceride represents what's going on inside the liver. So we can measure the production of palmitate in, in VLDL triglyceride that's circulating by de novo lipogenesis, and that gives us a mirror of a reflection of what's going on inside the liver. And with more sophisticated techniques, we can also measure the production of fatty acids or release of fatty acids into abdominal fat into the portal system that goes to the liver as well. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the contribution of visceral fat. Now, visceral fat is the most hated fat in the world. It's been given all the bad names because it's been associated with metabolic dysfunction. And so people have assumed it's a cause of metabolic dysfunction rather than maybe just an association of metabolic dysfunction. So Michael Jensen did this very nice study, which I simply reviewed here in an editorial where he uh, used isotope tracer where he could actually measure the contribution of visceral fat in the portal circulation, fatty acids that are going to the liver. The bottom line is this, is that when you release fatty acids from upper body fat and subcutaneous fat from lipolysis of adipose tissue, it goes into the circulation through the heart, and then it can be delivered to the liver directly through the hepatic artery, which is a very small percentage, maybe about 10 or 20 percent of, of, uh, of blood flow to the liver itself. But most of it goes through the splanchnic bed and relatively untouched by the splanchnic bed and then goes into the portal vein to the liver itself. Now, I won't go through the details of how he measured this by putting catheters in people's central veins and arteries, et cetera, but very sophisticated study where he found that if you're lean, about 5% of the fatty acids that are being delivered to the liver come from visceral fat. If you're obese, it's about 20%. So 80% of the fatty acids on average going to the liver uh, are derived from systemic lipolysis and not from visceral lipolysis. This suggests a very small contribution of visceral fat to fatty acids to the liver, but this is average. And he didn't separate obese people to those with and without fatty liver. Some of those people, 50% of the fatty acids went to the liver. Oops. 
that went to the liver were derived from visceral fat. So it's possible that increased release of fatty acids from visceral fat is an important contributor to NAFLD in people who have NAFLD, but that has never really been measured in people who are obese with and without NAFLD. What has been measured a lot is really this de novo lipogenesis, measuring the production of fatty acid from carbohydrate. Now this data has been remarkably misunderstood. Uh, we recently measured this very carefully in people who are obese with fatty liver disease, matched on adiposity, but normal uh, liver fat content and lean people. And you can see here the contribution of de novo lipogenesis to triglyceride rich lipoprotein, triglyceride palmitate, because you can only measure this in palmitate, progressively increases. And when you have NAFLD, about 40% of the palmitate in circulating triglycerides uh, are due to de novo lipogenesis. This means that about 40% of the palmitate in intrapatic triglyceride is made de novo as well uh, from carbohydrate. But this is only palmitate. This is not total triglyceride. Palmitate represents one of the three fatty acids that can be attached to triglyceride. So this 40% really translates into about 15% of total triglyceride production in the liver. So it's a small but important component of triglyceride production uh, in people that have fatty liver disease. And this intrapatic triglyceride content is directly correlated with the contribution of the novel epigenesis to triglyceride production in the liver in a curvilinear fashion, as you can see here, with the black circles being the NAFLD patients, gray being obese normal, and open white circles being the lean subject shown here. Now, why then do people have increased de novo lipogenesis if they have NAFLD? What's the mechanism for that? What is stimulating that? Well, we know major regulators of de novo lipogenesis are substrate delivery to liver glucose because glucose stimulates CHRBP, carbohydrate, you know, uh, this protein that is involved in converting glucose to fatty acid. And when you, and increasing glucose upregulates, all the genes are involved in that carbohydrate substrate driven de novo lipogenesis. In addition, we know that insulin stimulates the SRBP1C pathway. That's another pathway that produces triglyceride in the liver from de novo lipogenesis using a different set of enzymes and different set of genes. So there's two major regulators of de novo lipogenesis in the liver, insulin, and glucose. And you can see here that people who are obese with NAFLD, this is now 24 hour a day measurements. The purple uh, bars are, um, uh, the purple bar, uh, the, I mean, the pink bars are meals that are given uh, during the day as shown here. And you can see that you're obese with NAFLD 24 seven, you have higher glucose concentrations. These are people who do not have diabetes. They just have NAFLD compared to obese people without NAFLD. And if you have NAFLD, your insulin is higher all day long. So all day long, 24 seven, you're being bombarded. Your liver is being bombarded with higher glucose concentrations and higher insulin concentrations. So if insulin is high and people are insulin resistant in respect to glucose metabolism, there's this concept of selective insulin resistance where they're resistant to suppressing glucose production, but they're not resistant to insulin's effects in stimulating lipogenesis. And so we did these correlations in our subjects shown here that insulin 24 hour air into the curve and glucose 24 hour air into the curve uh, in our subjects. So all day long, their glucose and insulin concentrations correlate very nicely with de novo lipogenesis. So the more insulin, the greater is your de novo lipogenesis, the more glucose is the greater your glucose, uh, the greater is your de novo lipogenesis as well. Now this su supports both hypotheses both the substrate delivery hypothesis of stimulating novo lipogenesis, as well as the insulin uh, selective insulin resistance hypothesis. And so Brown and Goldstein uh, proposed this hypothesis way before we did this study uh, from data that they've, uh, I, I have, that they've done in rodent models, where they have shown and found that if you have increased insulin in an obese rodent model, you have insulin resistance to the production of glucose because your ability to shut down FOXO1, which regulates glucose production, this is through AKT phosphorylation, is impaired. So you have insulin resistance to suppressing glucose production. So that is now upregulated when you're insulin resistant. But you're not insulin resistant to SREPB1C to make triglyceride. And this lack of insulin resistance is not through 
the AKT phosphorylation pathways from uh, some other mechanism, it's not clear. It is due to insulin binding, of course, to the receptor in the liver, but it's not going through the traditional insulin signaling pathway, it's going through some other pathway. This yet has to be really resolved in, in humans. And there's a paper recently came out from Jerry Schulman's group, Maria Surley in diabetes care that suggests substrate uh, delivery to the liver is a major mechanism responsible for increased de novo lipogenesis and not selective insulin resistance, but that remains to be determined uh, in people. Now, the final aspect of this, and I see I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna skip through uh, some things here. I'm running low because of the interruptions. I was constantly had the beginning of the presentation from Dr. Weiss, who insisted that I show you my slides and that you hear me uh, as well. He's such a, uh, he's, he's su such a perfectionist. <clears throat> so anyway, there's several then. So now the question is, how does adipose tissue contribute to di at metabolic dysfunction in people that have fatty liver disease? Is adipose tissue a major regulator of health in people that have NAFLD? And that NAFLD is a marker of adipose tissue dysfunction. And so we took these studies where we have, again, all these studies are similar, uh, lean people uh, who are healthy lean, obese people who are obese with normal glucose tolerance, normal liver fat content, and obese people with fatty liver disease, and they're much more insulin resistant than these people who are obese without fatty liver disease. You can see here, consistent with some studies that are shown in rodents, adipose tissue oxygen content or oxygen tension progressively decreases when you go from lean to obese NAFL. So there's less oxygen content. Now this is interstitial oxygen. This is not intracellular adipocyte oxygen. You can't measure that. So it's a very surrogate kind of marker. And this decrease in oxygen is associated with an increase in gene expression of HIF1 alpha, which is a marker of hypoxia in any tissue. And this may stimulate a cascade of metabolic events that can cause this uh, adipose tissue and systemic potentially insulin resistance. And this insulin stimulated glucose uptake, a measure of insulin sensitivity during the clamp procedure is directly correlated with oxygen content in adipose tissue. So we see this relationship. Again, all the studies I'm gonna show you now in humans, it's all relationships. We can't really determine cause and effect. You've gotta go back to rodents or cell culture systems where you can knock out or knock in or upregulate genes, which you obviously can't do very well uh, in people. Now the second, so oxygen is one potential factor. Another one, it seems that lipogenic capacity, this ability to convert fatty acids, uh, to convert carbohydrate to fatty acids in adipose tissue is also a marker, if not a cause of metabolic health. And so if you measure CHRBP in adipose tissue, uh, gene expression, this is done now uh, by Barbara Kahn's group. We simply gave her samples from our human subjects where we find that insulin stimulated glucose uptake progressively improves with increasing CHRB, CHRBP mRNA in adipose tissue. Quite remarkable correlation here. The more capacity you have for lipogenesis in adipose tissue, the greater is your insulin sensitivity. Again, association is not cause and effect. Also, if you look at MOGAT1, another enzyme that's involved in uh, making triglyceride in adipose tissue, if it's downregulated, it's downregulated in NAFL compared to obese, normal, and lean. CD36, which is a transport protein of fatty acids, if it's downregulated in adipose tissue, delivering fatty acids to adipose tissue, that's, it's downregulated in NAFL. And fatty acid synthase, which is an important, again, uh, enzyme that's involved in the node of lipogenesis, is downregulated in people with NAFL. So this tells you that all the mechanisms involved in producing fat and delivering fatty acids and storing fat in adipose tissue seems to be abnormal in people with NAFLD compared to people who don't have NAFLD. Now, why that causes insulin resistance is not clear cut, or if it's just an association. Now, the third thing in adipose tissue is collagen. This is really da data that has been stimulated by Phil Shear's research in rodent models, uh, showing that fibrosis in adipose tissue in rodents can cause insulin resistance associated. So recently measured, in fact, this is being sent out re for review today. So if anybody is a reviewer, uh, please um, be kind. Uh, uh, being submitted today, not sent out for review today. Uh, that people with NAFL have increased collagen 1 alpha 1 production. This is measured de novo, in vivo, by using deuterated water. So people with NAFL have increased collagen production. They've increased collagen gene expression. And this collagen 
uh, gene expression uh, um, is related to insulin concentrations. And we know that insulin is a regulator of collagen production in all tissues. So it might be that increased insulin is causing this increase in collagen production uh, in fat tissue itself. In addition, this increased collagen expression is negatively associated with insulin sensitivity. So the more gene expression of collagen, the worse is your insulin sensitivity. I'm gonna skip that and go on to this. And then if you look at finally, immunology of adipose tissue, you see that people who have NAFLD have an increased number of these angry M1-like macrophages and more pro-inflammatory macrophages. They have a decreased number of the <clears throat> M2-like macrophages. And this is associated with insulin sensitivity uh, somehow itself, that if you have increased M1-like macrophages, you have progressively worse insulin sensitivity in these groups. If increased M2-like macrophages, insulin sensitivity on a whole body level is progressively increased. This is glucose rate of disappearance divided by insulin concentration during the clamp procedure. So again, we're seeing associations. We don't know cause and effect uh, between all of these abnormalities in adipose tissue and insulin resistance in people with NAFLD. I'm going to skip this one. And, but how does this translate into systemic uh, insulin resistance? Well, if you measure all some of the classic cytokines, you know, uh, and uh, pro-inflammatory sort of proteins, PI-1 is the big one, but tnf alpha, CCL2, uh, interferon gamma, IL-1 beta, I can't re read this, it's blocked out on my screen. Um, I don't know if I can remove that thing. No, I can't. Um, you can see that the people who are obese NAFL don't always have higher plasma concentrations now over 24 hours than people who are obese normal and green. You can see they're the same here. You can see the obese novel is actually lower here for IL-1 beta than the normal obese. Here, the normal obese is greater concentrations than the NAFL subjects here. Here you see they're the same and here you see they're the same. What is different is PI-1. That's remarkably different in the NAFL people versus the non nafl obese and lean people. And the concentrations are different. This is the picograms for ML, it's hugely higher compared to these very low concentrations here, three, four, you know, 0.4. These are very low concentrations and probably have no systemic metabolic effect, but PI-1 is actually very high. And if you measure the relationship between PI-1 concentration and insulin sensitivity during a clamp, glucose RD uh, divided by insulin concentration, you see this inverse correlation as well. So PI-1 is negatively correlated with insulin sensitivity it's produced by adipose tissue, and it's very different in people with NAFLD and not NAFLD. Again, we don't know if it's cause and effect, but evidence in rodents suggests that this could be causative in causing insulin resistance. Now, the final thing I want to review in the last three or four minutes is the effect of diet and weight loss on people with NAFLD, because there are no th drugs that are approved for treating NAFLD. There are drugs that are approved for treating a diabetes that might be good in NAFLD, and so everybody here who treats diabetes patients, you have familiarity with drugs that you could be that you could use to treat your patients who are obese with diabetes and NAFL. This is showing a remarkable study from Cuba that needs to be repeated, but it's a study where they had people undergo a weight loss diet for a year, and then they retrospectively divided them into buckets of less than five percent weight loss, five to seven percent weight loss, seven to nine, and then you know ten or greater percent weight loss shown here with these different colors at the end of one year. And what you see is, is that, <clears throat> is that um, steatosis is markedly sensitive to weight loss. And that when you lose 10% or more of your weight loss, steatosis improves. This is a percent of subject to improve is, is nearly 100% in people with um, NAFLD. And you can see here even 5%, less than 5%, you have a 35% of subjects reduced their steatosis. This is based on biopsy but this progressive improvement with progressive uh, weight loss. Steatohepatitis also progressively improved. The NAFLD activity score progressively improved. Ballooning uh, liver cells progressively improved progressive weight loss. Fibrosis is the one that's the most resistant to weight loss. And only when people lost about 10% or more of the weight did they get a significant percentage of subjects, 45% of subjects who had a regression of at least one point in their fibrosis score. But again, this is looking at a very small number of subjects. Only 10% of the total 300 subjects had a decrease, uh, if 10% more decrease in fibrosis, and only you know, 30, 
30% of total subjects had significant fibrosis, two or three stage three fibrosis where they could increase. So this needs to be repeated in uh, further studies. And this is confirmed really in studies of uh, bariatric surgery where people lost a lot of weight at one year and five years after different bariatric surgery procedures. And you can see the change in cirrhosis. This is stage four fibrosis shown here um, is unchanged after five years of weight loss, but stage three and stage two is markedly reduced. So those are much more sensitive to weight loss effects, even marked weight loss, whereas more severe fibrosis like cirrhosis is probably you know, untouched, but a lot of weight loss can help stage three fibrosis and can also help uh, stage two fibrosis. And you can see the marked improvement in NASH resolution five years after surgery, 80, 85%, 84% of people don't have NASH in a year at five years uh, with surgical uh, procedures but the fibrosis resolution itself is more blunted. Um, F1 and F2, the lower stage of fibrosis, there's a greater percentage of patients than in the higher stage of fibrosis, F3 and F4. Now, SGLT2-1 inhibitors cause people to lose weight. And you can see the more weight you lose, the greater is your reduction in intrahepatic triglyceride content. So losing even two or 3% of body weight reduces liver fat content. And if you use a TZD, pioglitazone, you can see that that causes weight, uh, that may not cause weight loss. In fact, it can cause weight gain, but it has weight loss, indep weight independent effects on NAFL. You can see here that the fibrosis scores even go down, that people who get pioglitazone actually can reduce their fibrosis score. They reduce their uh, intrahepatic triglyceride fat measurement, inflammation goes down, and the cross deliver cells go down. So TZDs, which are not used so much, but are very inexpensive, uh, but not used because of their increase in body weight, uh, improves fatty liver disease. And finally, semaglutide, the newest kid on the block, a major paper known in general medicine, showing that people on semaglutide at the higher doses lose a large amount of weight, you know, 12 to 15% of their body weight. And this caught the percentage of patients who resolve their NASH with no worsening fibrosis is very high, 60%, but surprisingly, very little effect on fibrosis. Part of this might be due to the placebo group, which had a very high resolution, uh, improvement in fibrosis, not resolution, but improving fibrosis by one point. So there is no difference and no progressive change. So why does semaglutide cause weight loss and really resolve NASH, but have such a blunted effect, it seems, on fibrosis is unclear. Is this a fluke or is this real? So I wanna just end with this, where we have to think of our patients not just as individual organ systems. The hepatologist looks at the liver, the obesity doctor just looks at this, the, the cardiologist just looks at you know, the heart. We really, as endocrinologists, you have to look at more than just diabetes and prediabetes, but look at the whole picture. Do organ systems biology on your patients. And this unhealthy excess adiposity causes insulin resistance, causes these metabolic abnormalities that cause fatty liver disease, cause diabetes and heart disease. And so if you can address this part, not just wait to addressing this part here, you can prevent and treat uh, all of these diseases. So I'll stop there and thank uh, everyone who listened, as well as the group who does these studies. I won't go through their names, but it really requires a uh, basic scientist who can look at the tissues and cells that we uh, generate from people, the mathematical modeling uh, people like Bruce Patterson shown up here, uh, and uh, also technicians, dietitians, et cetera, who really do the hard work of the studies in getting these studies done and recruiting subjects. Thank you, I'll stop there. And there's still uh, a few minutes left uh, potentially for questions. Dr. Klein, thank you. That was an absolute tour de force and you always have been an absolute icon in my mind as someone who does true clinical research. And although you stressed in several of your sides how expensive, this was an expensive isotopin experiment. And I know that's our people tend to emphasize that, but the truth is the intricacies of doing human research is absolutely, what you've accomplished is absolutely inspiring. And I thank you so very much. In fact, it's, it's really appropriate that you're the speaker for today's Fishman lecture, because it's true that Dr. Lawrence, Lawrence Fishman himself epitomized exactly that, being the uh, tantamount endocrinologist of someone that was able to go from bedside to bench and back again, and truly was not only that, but a compassionate physician. And you, you epitomize all those things. So 
thank you so much for joining us from St. Louis today. I, there are a couple of questions um, that- oh, wait, I, wait, before you, I, I think we should stop there, Roy. I, we can't do better than that. No, <laughs> no one can do better than you, Sam. You, you did an absolute splendid job. And um, so the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which you alluded to and mentioned in your, in your last slide, it's concerning that, right, that they didn't fix the fibrosis, but fix the other thing. Is there any reason why not, though, to continue to prescribe them? And, and, and I see the FDA recently approved uh, the higher dose specifically for weight loss. Do you still think there's a role for it uh, in, in that thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think the high dose of uh, GLP-1 uh, is really a game changer in terms of obesity, where you get this massive weight loss and you, you improve all the metabolic abnormalities associated with obesity at the same time. You improve a lot of liver stuff in this 72-week trial, but not fibrosis so much. The fibrosis might take a much longer time to resolve. If you, if you treat hepatitis C and kill the virus off, it takes a long time for the fibrosis you know, to go away. So it's possibly need a longer time period to really see that. Uh, but it certainly suggests that you will prevent the progression of fibrosis by getting rid of the metabolic abnormalities in the milieu that is causing that fibrosis. Thank you. Dr. Fornoni, you have a question? Yes, thanks for the excellent talk, uh, Dr. Klein. Uh, and you mentioned that the SGLT2 inhibitor and the protection from fatty liver may be linked to weight loss, but could it be a direct metabolic effect on the liver on fatty acid utilizations rather than just a... Um, better insulin sensitivity or uh, body weight loss. And the same for minor cortical receptor antagonists that, that are coming in this space for cardiorenal protection. Could it be the mechanism through the improvement of the fatty liver? Yeah, it's a very good question. Very hard to determine. We don't know the answer to your question, first of all, I should just say upfront from the data available. But it looks like if you look at weight loss from diet versus weight loss placebo with SGLT21 and the SGLT1 treatment group, the, the fat in the liver decreases the same in all of those groups, but there's no biopsy studies to see if there's any other beneficial effects on liver histology, you know, ballooning of cells, inflammation, fibrosis, et cetera. That's never been done. But the fat in the liver looks like it's weight loss dependent. Thank you. I refer everyone to the chat to identify the uh, link in order to answer the uh, CME credit uh, questions that Dr. Klein has tricked us in preparing. And um, we look forward to Dr. Klein visiting us in person in Miami in the very near future. So everyone be safe and thank you for coming to Grand Rounds today to this very special Fishman Grand Rounds. Thank you. Sam, Zeitz gesund, be gesund. It's so great to see you. Lashanaha ba in Miami. Thank you, Roy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye, Sam. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ernesto. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>